Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to what is the second session of the BYLC South Asia uh, Youth Resilience Summit. We're very grateful for uh, the wonderful speakers we have on board today, as well as the audience that we have so far. I see about 70 people are on board at the moment. Um, I encourage the audience that are currently watching to share the links with their friends and, and family and encourage the, the audience to grow so that we can make this discussion as fruitful as possible. I'd like to start this session by um, acknowledging and thanking the leadership at Bangladesh Youth Leadership Center for the vision and the work that they've put into making this happen. For the last 12 years, BYLC has been at the forefront of establishing and enabling young people all across Bangladesh to develop the skills that they need to be able to su succeed in the future. These skills include things like empathy, teamwork, uh, compassionate leadership, and uh, critical thinking. And BYLC has again come together to put together this wonderful session in, in what is, of course, some unprecedented, unprecedented times that we're all going through. Today we have, um, over the next one hour, we're going to be um, uh, speaking about the topic of putting youth in charge and young people as change makers. Um, and in order to do that, we have three very special speakers who represent three very different countries um, um, from across the region. First and foremost, we have Eileen Saleh, who uh, is the founder of uh, Acumen Academy Bangladesh um, and has uh, extensive history of working with young people in the region over the last uh, decade or so. Then we have Anshul Tewari, who is the founder and editor-in-chief editor of Youth Key Hours. Um, and uh, um, Anshul will also be joining us in, and be introducing himself in, in a few minutes' time. And of course, the last speaker we have is um, Ali Reza Khan, who um, has joined us all the way from Pakistan, and, and he has been running the YES network of, of Pakistan for the last few years. And before I get the speakers to introduce themselves and speak a bit about their platforms, I want all of you who are watching today, and, and there's currently 365 of you, which is absolutely fantastic, to write in the comment box below, where are you uh, joining this live recording from? Be as specific as possible, the city and the country that you're, you're um, online from. And without further, further ado, maybe 90 seconds I'll give to each speaker. Um, and we can start with uh, Eileen, um, just to speak a bit about yourself, as well as what Acumen Academy Bangladesh does. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Eileen, and I'm part of the leadership team at Acumen Academy Bangladesh. Um, our mission is to empower and unleash the new generation of uh, social innovation, innovators, leaders, uh, with the determination and grit to build a more just, inclusive, and sustainable world. Um, we call ourselves the University Reimagined. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, uh, Anshul, do you want to go next? Sure, uh, Shantanu, thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Anshul, and I run uh, Youth Ki Awaz, which means Voice of the Youth. Um, it is currently India's largest uh, completely crowdsourced media platform, which means that anybody can uh, share their stories. And we focus on uh, largely on social justice issues. Um, so it's a lot of social political conversation happening on our platform uh, by more than 100,000 people um, and being read by close to four and a half to five million people a month. Uh, many of these stories end up having a considerable amount of impact uh, on ground, on the policy uh, makers, uh, and even end up starting a lot of civic movements around uh, us in India. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and to be meeting young people from all across uh, South Asia. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Anshul. Um, and Ali, we'll, we'll uh, uh, want to hear your introduction now. Hi. Hi, Ali. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me? Perfectly. Okay, great. Uh, it's a great honor to be here today. This is Ali Azhar Khan. I'm the founder of Youth Engagement Services Network Pakistan. It's a social enterprise dedicated to create, activate, and multiply spaces for youth change making 
Yes, facilitate several thousand young people every year to begin their change making journey. We are having educational and technical institutions to become change making campuses. We are seen as a premier resource to unlock the change making potential of young people in Pakistan. We have recently tested change making intelligence test, uh, which basically uh, helps young people to get started as change makers with unheard success rate. So it's a great honor to be here. I'm looking forward to share my thoughts and experiences with all of you. Fantastic. And I again welcome everyone who's joined over the last few minutes. There's now close to 500 viewers. Um, um, I see there's someone from Nepal, Adit Pan. Uh, a very well, well welcome to everyone who's joined us from Nepal, um, as well as some viewership from Indonesia and different parts of the world that are also outside of South Asia. So a very well, warm welcome to you. I encourage you to keep sharing the link and, and um, keep following this discussion. So thank you all for that, for that um, wonderful intro introduction into your journey and um, the journey that your organization has been on over the last few years. I want to start this discussion by getting an overview. This, this crisis that we're currently facing is unprecedented. The, the, the youth that have been born um, in the last few decades have not seen something like this before. And, and there has never been something in the world that has affected everyone as uniformly as what we're seeing today with the coronavirus. So I wanted to hear from each and um, um, each one of you what the impact of this virus has had on the youth population in your countries. And, and maybe I'll start with you, Ali, since you're on screen. Um, if you could just speak about, about how the youth are responding in Pakistan. Yeah, actually, you, if you look at the you know population of Pakistan, we have a huge youth quake in this country. You seventy percent of the population is under the age of thirty-three, and you know thirty million people are in between the ages of fifteen to twenty-nine, and they're seriously affected by this coronavirus. And I think we are caught in a kind of a catch twenty-two situation. You know, we don't know whether to go to save lives or whether to go to save livelihoods. And as we have already mentioned that, it's not only you know, a health issue, it's also an economic issue, it's a social issue, it's a cultural issue, it's an educational issue. And I see a tremendous change. You know, this is unprecedented and nobody has expected this. We're talking about young people, I think my parents have not expected this and never experienced this in their lives as kind of a you know, you know, virus. So uh, I think you know, things have changed tremendously during the last three months. Socially, culturally, educationally, when I look at from social perspective, I think you can imagine that you know we live in a world today now where hugs and kisses will be seen as a sign of ignorance. We are shaking hands will be seen, you know, something very risky. Even sitting with parents would be very, you know, sometimes risky. You might transfer them a virus. So I think you know our our events has ended with you know sports, with restaurants, with shopping malls. And the most affected population right now, in my opinion, is children and young people because they were already on the edge. You know, they were sitting, uh, you know, already, you know, in a kind of situation where they were looking for resources and, you know, opportunities to realize their potential. And then what happened, this has come at the time when they were about to take off. You know, every year, millions of young people are there being graduated and they're looking for opportunities to contribute. And you know, if you look at the stats of Pakistan, like 57% of the youth is neither working or seeking jobs. So you know, you can imagine the kind of you know challenge we are facing right now. But on the other side of it, I think like, this is a great opportunity for us to revisit our policies and roadmaps. And young people are trying to basically discover their talents, and we are, they are trying to you know uh, reimagine their future. Because this was not happening before. Nobody has experienced this. Nobody has even anticipated this. So I see this is both, you know, yes, this is a day, you know, very dangerous situation in a way that, you know, it is affecting many lives. But when I look at the numbers in Pakistan, we are not doing bad right now, you know, uh, with the case of God, you know, the number of cases are not that high. We have like six, uh, more than 6,000 people affected. And uh, still, the things are under control. But the only challenge is how to help young people, especially to basically reintegrate into society once the coronavirus is over. Because the biggest challenge would be to help them to reintegrate socially and economically. And this would be the same situation in India, and Bangladesh, and many other countries. Because you know they might need a lot of help from institutions, and institutions might not be ready for that kind of help. So that would be the biggest worry and challenge right now we are facing. And I hope that you know this kind of conversation will help us to move forward with better wisdom and the scenes. Right, right. Just before I move to Eileen to share her thoughts from Bangladesh, um, I also want to encourage everyone who's on the live stream today to share in the comment section 
How has the coronavirus hit you the hardest? What aspect of your life has been impacted the most as a result of this situation that we're all in? It'd be really nice for you, you all to share on the comments section um, what you're going through and what your experience has been. I know that we, we are getting a lot of viewership from different countries, um, also outside of, outside of South, South Asia. And, and please do continue to, to sort of uh, share, this, share this stream with your friends and family so that we can get more perspectives and, and have more comments um, on, on the comment box. I'll now move to Eileen. Eileen, um, um, as, as in Pakistan, the youth demographic in Bangladesh as well is also skewed towards young people and, and um, through media reports, through conversations, um, young people have of course also been um, severely impacted from a social, economic and, and health perspective. Where are you seeing the biggest impacts uh, that young people are facing in Bangladesh? Sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Shantanu, and thank you, Adi, for the, the commentary. Um, I think before I begin, I would like to take a step back and reflect on a question um, that's pertinent to pretty much everybody who's on this um, um, Facebook Live today. So um, how many of us um, during these days on a daily basis um, feel anxious, feel fearful, helpless, hopeless? Um, and then how many of us are actually asking for help? Um, these times are unprecedented, like we all know. Um, I think what we really need to start is by being compassionate to ourselves and to the people around us. Um, so when we are going through these times, we are going through a lot of loss and grief. Um, and this idea that loss, no loss is too small. Um, for example, every day I used to go to the park at 5 p.m. with my children. Um, the park is closed for the past month. And that is my loss. That is the loss of my family. Um, and I should, if I want to, be able to grief it. You know, this idea of grief uh, in this hierarchy, there's no such thing as hierarchy in grief. You know, every, every loss is important to the person who's dealing with it. The, the next important thing that youth especially are grieving is the anticipatory loss. You know, this idea of we will be able to graduate. Will I be able to find a job? Um, I was supposed to get married in June. Um, will I have my wedding? Um, will my elderly parents be able to overcome or survive this virus? Um, and these are important questions. And these are questions that are not in our control, but we still need to give our ti ourselves time and space to process them. Um, so this idea that just because uh, youth is resilient, youth has a lot of grit, you know, take time for yourself and be able to see where you are in this. Um, and then eventually when the dust settles in your mind, um, even if it's temporarily, um, we'll hopefully be able to see um, or start thinking clearly about opportunities of the future. Um, especially for people who are on this Facebook Live. We are privileged few who don't have to think about day-to-day -day survival, who don't have to think about um, you know, fighting for food and relief. Rather, we're the ones who are supporting others dealing with that. And so this is really the time um, of sense-making. Um, and there are three things that I thought that would be really important around this time. Um, so the first is this idea of um, the work that we offer during this crisis. Um, regardless how small or large it is, uh, we have to go on, even little by little. If that means just staying put and studying, continuing the education, or if we're teaching, teaching in meaningful, innovative ways. Um, if we are doing amazing disaster management relief work, like we see all, all across the country and all across the world, actually, um, especially for marginalized, vulnerable communities, that's great. Um, if not, we can support the pavement dwellers or the cats and dogs who live on our streets. The second is around um, the love that we give and, and the courage that we um, dissipate, you know, even in this uh, suffering. Um, we had Poila Boshak uh, two days ago. Um, we saw people in balconies, on the roof, celebrating. Uh, we see people on the internet 
singing, dancing, poetry recitals for themselves and for their loved ones. I think that community has never been stronger and we should be able to continue to do this moving forward. Um, and the very last thing is the story that we keep on telling ourselves, right? Reminding ourselves of the promise of the new world, of a better world. Um, so what would that look like for each one of us, the youth or the young adults who are just trying to figure out meaning in life, purpose in life? You know, we often say that we want to live a life of purpose. Um, so this virus is giving us those opportunities to rethink the way um, we measure success or the criteria in which we measure success. Um, instead of income, what would it look like if we were to measure success by the number of people that we support or the lives that we impact or touch? Instead of a big office, what would it look like if we were to measure success um, by the, the big hearts that people have? So really about service and living for the other. And that, I mean, I think for me is what you know, the youth can really, really get encouragement as we move out of this phase and try to go to the next phase of what the new norm would look like. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing those insights, Aileen. Um, absolutely beautifully said. And to all our viewers in Bangladesh, uh, a very happy Shabonabha Bosho to you. I, I hope the new year, albeit indoors, was, was very prosperous and, and you did, did get to have good food with your family and, and enjoyed it as much as you could have. I wanted to share a comment that we had um, Eileen from Jay Noor in um, Nepal, I believe. And, and he's, he said that his experience of quarantine so far has been like feeling, feeling like he's in a jailhouse. It's been 32 days of his life that he's had in quarantine. So this aspect that you spoke about in terms of each person's grieving and each person's experience being important, right? And, and the importance of us to have that togetherness as humanity and, and to unleash that while we're in this situation is absolutely critical and, and i'd be very interested to hear from from jai i mean who i mean how are you dealing with 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 the quarantine you say like you say you're feeling like you're in a jailhouse but who has been there for you to to go, get through this for the people that you lean towards um that have been helping you through this um i wanted to get to uh, Anch, uh Anchul, um, um with the same question i know that uh, prior to the current uh, prior to the coronavirus hitting india there was a lot of political movement from young people um a lot of young people were involved in the shaheen bug um, uh, protests that were happening and, and there was a lot of activity um, um, where young people were on edge, as Eileen mentioned. How has this affected young people in India? Uh, thank you, Shantanu. And I think Eileen and Ali have both like summed it up, uh, you know, for, for, for me as well. Uh, um, you know, really echo everything that they said. I just want to add uh, another very important aspect to it. Um, like you said, young people in India were super active uh, politically and there were various uh, social movements that were happening. Of course, uh, you know, it's, it's created a lot of anxiety. It's created a lot of um, uh, worry among young people in India on what's going to happen to those issues that they've been uh, advocating for, uh, especially now that we don't have access to the streets, we don't have access to, um, you know, uh, so much more, uh, you know, than, than we did at that time. The whole social media conversation is right now about COVID. It's not about any other issue and you can't possibly talk about it as well because of course, it's the first time we're dealing uh, with a pandemic, right? You can't possibly um, imagine uh, talking about anything else right now. Uh, I do want to talk about one more thing, though, uh, Shantanu, which is super important and critical for me uh, personally and, and for the kind of work that we are doing and what we've seen in the last couple of days in India. Um, you know, the, the, while this, this pandemic has had a, a severe impact on young people who are, uh, you know, like us, privileged, have access to homes, uh, it's had an even bigger impact and probably an unimaginable impact on people who are, uh, you know, not like us, who are not privileged and who don't come from the same uh, luxury of having an internet connection, having access to food, having access to uh, essential services, or even having, having uh, as basic as an identity, uh, you know, in, in, in countries like India. Uh, we saw when the lockdown started, how there was a massive migrant movement in India, um, you know, where, where, where migrant workers from across the country were just trying to go home on foot. Um, many of them died while they were going home. Many of them were actually very young, um, you know, the, the, the people who actually died. Uh, and I think what ends up happening when we talk about youth resilience is that um, 
a lot of these conversations kind of tend to forget uh, or not forget but but tend, kind of tend to uh, you know not include voices of such young people who are not who don't have access or who have always been at the margins uh, and i think we need to kind of recognize and realize that there is a huge crisis that we are facing uh, you know especially for migrant workers i know that's the case in uh, uh, you know in, in other south asian countries as well uh, along with that another thing very similar that 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 india is dealing with and i know pakistan and bangladesh have also been dealing with uh, is the unemployment crisis which is only going to grow bigger now um uh, of course you you possibly cannot have a a, a backup plan for uh, you know something like this um uh, but at the same time the fact that we were already doing pretty terribly and now we're going to go even worse um you know is 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 going to make things even more difficult for young people from across uh, uh, the region so i think um uh, as we all including our respective governments uh, try and figure out how to deal with this and and we must all completely support all their efforts i think it's also super important to keep reminding uh, you know people in positions of power that there are millions of young people who need a little bit more urgent attention uh and 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 maybe swifter policy making to make sure that we are able to cater to their needs and that they don't uh um uh, uh suffer uh you know because of associated reasons uh as we try and deal with this crisis right right thank you thank you anshul for sharing and um we'll get into the conversation about um uh a, a solutions oriented approach and and the role that young people can play in driving the systems change that you spoke about anshul and and driving the change that you spoke about um in a bit i just wanted to share as well um the comments that have been coming in from our audience and um there's a comment from uh, abdullah al maruf um that speaks to exactly what you just mentioned anshul um and he said that he feels disheartened about the aftermath that will face post covid-19 especially because he's a fresh graduate who is supposed to be starting his career now and similarly we have another comment from atik yasir um he said that as we as we know we're not accustomed to experiencing these kinds of disasters so the impact is still a little bit underrated amongst us so being a young person what is it to be done or will be what will we be expecting from the society when the real, real rebuilding process starts and maybe i'll pass that question to you ali um again the question is what can the rebuilding process look like when when um the society overcomes covid and when we reach a when we reach a point where we've overcome this pandemic what will the rebuilding process look like Ali uh, you're on mute um so we'll have to just quickly unmute you Yes sorry can you Yes you are on mute please continue Okay sorry uh, I was saying that I totally agree with I'm sure what he was saying that you know the greatest challenge right now is to safeguard the human dignity because there are so many young people out there who are feeling you know isolated and they don't know what to do with their lives right now you know I I met many young people they were saying you know they prefer to die you know with corona virus rather than dying with starvation because they see their parents are on the road they are looking for medicine and they're looking for so many of the services in italy and nobody is there to you know raise their voice and to help them to get all these services but how we can you know handle this you know situation like this in future i think the most important thing we need to learn is that you know we need to understand that how important it is to engage young people to unlock the thing the potential of young people to rely on young people because i have been hearing this all my life i have spent like almost two decades working with young people and i have been hearing the same discussion that young people needs to be you know heard they need to be involved i think we need to go beyond that you know we are living in a new world today we need to change paradigms you know unless and until we change paradigms we will never be able to change this world because the problem lies with the paradigm this paradigm does not see young people as change makers it doesn't see young people as someone who can add value to society they hold them back They, this paradigm provides them a very lengthy timeline for success you know they are following the same you know a timeline which was followed by 30 40 years ago by people so i think we need to change in you know, a sense of expectation sense of merit a sense of performance because unless and until we change that you know we will never be able to mainstream young people you see what happened when this virus has struck you know even the developed countries are looking for volunteers they don't know what to do with this you know this happened in the past when earthquake has come when flood came you know every time we look at young people to come and help them out and after that you know we have no policy to continuously engage them in solving these issues 
you see, it's very important for us today to you know, make a policy at country level to provide at least one opportunity to every young person to add value in the society. I'm not saying that they need to be provided an opportunity to set up a company, an organization. I'm saying at least one opportunity to add value in the society. This should be part of education. Unfortunately, unfortunately the biggest obstacle right now in helping young people to become change makers is education. You see, imagine that you spent 16, 20 years in education and then still you don't know how to add value because this system doesn't allow you to do this. So uh, what we are doing in Pakistan, and I really wanted to share this with her, you know, we have invented a very simple and scalable method to activate young people at change makers. We call it change making intelligence test. It is unlike other tests where you have to basically give correct answers, where you are just against your personal excellence. It is kind of a test where you are evaluated by your performance, you know, in the society, you know, how you create social economic impact in the society. Imagine young people are not assessed in the classrooms. They are assessed in the fields by the change-making projects. You know, we would have win-win situation for everybody. You know, there would be millions of people working on several issues. We will not be, you know, relying on few people to deliver at the kind of crisis. So now my suggestion is to, you know, set up a mechanism, permanent mechanism, change the paradigms and help young people at least get one opportunity through, you know, educational institutions, through communities to give back to the society. And uh, we have developed a kind of a professional framework which basically facilitates young people from no impact to global impact. Because, you know, once you start your journey, young people don't know how to, you know, proceed. You know, they carry out the project, then they, they look for others to tell them what is next. So I think it's very important to develop a kind of tools and, you know, validation methods and progression frameworks where basically young people can learn themselves how to proceed and handle such situations. And one thing, you know, which is very important for us to understand in this situation that what coronavirus has taught us that, you know, it's, you know, greatness uh, doesn't provide you humanity. Technology doesn't provide you humanity. Economic prosperity doesn't provide you humanity. You know, your high GDP data doesn't provide you humility. What provides humility is your compassion, your respect, you know, it's your ability to add value in society. And unless and until we unlock this ability, we would be, you know, having the same kind of crisis again and again. Fantastic. And, and on that note, I mean, we have a lot of comments that are coming through. And what I do encourage is our viewers and our audience who are on our Facebook live stream to have a conversation with also with each other on the comment section to respond to each other and, and respond to the questions that you all have. But for the purposes of um, one of the comments that we have uh, here, um, Farid Ahmed, and I'll keep this question to you, Ali. Um, very quickly, um, his, his question is, what are five tips that you would have to overcome this situation? Five tips Sorry? to overcome this situation. Sorry, can what are five tips that you would give to young people to overcome this situation? Uh, you see, the biggest tip is that yeah, they need to go out and find a way to add value in the society. You know, they must not wait for anybody to come and help them out. You know, life is not do it for me project. Life is do it by yourself project. Most of the times we are waiting and, you know, waiting for someone to come and believe in us. You know, they need to go out and see, you know, this is the 21st century. It's very easy for anybody from anywhere in, in the world to plug into the world, share their ideas, share their work. You know, we can't say that people have no opportunity to share their work. Today, I think we are living in a new world. You know, every day we have to decide whether we want to change the game or we want to repeat the game. And most of the times I see young people prefer to repeat the game. And the compensation is huge if you, if you drive the change and if you follow the change. And I, I would strongly encourage him to go out and see how he can add value in society, how he can spot an opportunity to add value in society. He can be the first, he can be unique. And it's not something he has to learn from the society. I have learned over the years that struggle is the best training. When you go out, you know, when you start doing something, you know, you get invisible help, you, you get people, you know, when you create value, you attract people, you attract institutions, you attract resources. When you consume value, you repel people. So my suggestion is to start adding value, start creating value, you will automatically, you know, attract people and resources and people will come and help you out. Fantastic. And, and that's, a, that's a very nice message of hope, Ali. Um, go out and in a situation of crisis, try to find where you through your gift, gifts and skills can add value to society and, and can add something to, to improve society. I wanted to ask you, Eileen, we have a comment here from uh, Brigitte Rupa from Taka in Bangladesh. And she's asked that we're all aware of how tough it is to stay home all day. Um, and we're all aware of that, e even the panelists. Um, how can we get motivated positively 
in this situation, knowing that it'll worsen in the coming days ahead. And on top of that as well, Ellie, um, um, I wanted to know from you as well, if we reflect on the situation that we're in today, um, what has brought us to where we are today? Why is this happening uh, to all of us and why is it impacting all of us today? Um, um, I would like, love for you to give a reflection on that. So I'll start with the first one. Um, thank you for the question. I think the very first thing we need to do is um, a one-armed hug. So at Acumen, um, a one-armed hug is where we, from one hand, we are one arm, we're actually holding ourselves, but the other one, we're just pushing ourselves to get out of our comfort zone and just do that little bit extra, a little bit more. So on a daily basis, you know, it's about being compassionate um, towards yourself, but also, you know, being able to stay positive, not just for yourself, but for the home and the community in which you're at. Um, try doing um, daily practices, daily positive practices. See if you can find a sanctuary where you, you can be yourself, whether it's in quiet or to really understand what's happening inside of you. Um, feel your pulse see if you can on a daily basis, you know, check your feelings. And then there are days where, where nothing gets done and it's okay, right? But what do you learn from that? Um, and then there are days where you are positive and you can continue to, to do more and act tough and not just for yourself, but also for your family and your community. So yeah, just a few tips to see where you are. A routine definitely helps. Fantastic. And um, Eileen, the, 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 the next question was, um, if you were to reflect on uh, the situation that we're in today, how did we collectively as a globalized world today get here? Um, um, what are the factors that have played a part in getting us to where we are today? Right. Yeah, I think that's, that's a, a question that a lot of us are reflecting on, right? Like these tensions we have in our mind around um, was the world how we wanted it to be in the first place? You know, we talk about climate change, um, we talk about poverty, you know, most of us are in, in the space of development, the youth, they, they are entrepreneurs, they're wanting to do something. Uh, were we okay with the status quo to begin with? Um, and so like the way I see it, especially for this audience, this is that opportunity to say that, no, we don't agree with the status quo. Every time when we were going on a straight path, we thought there was a crossroad. You know, we thought we could do something about hunger and poverty and child mortality and the environment. We always thought we could do that extra. But I feel like now that opportunity is there. We are at a crossroad. Um, and it would depend on the 60% under the age of 24 in Bangladesh, the under more than 50% in Pakistan, in India, like it will depend on this youth to see how not only can you mobilize yourself, but mobilize the, the, the your friends, your, you know, your community, your families around you. Um, like Ali said, um, yes, the government is there, but the actual work needs to happen at this level, right? At a very, very basic human level. Um, and that's when real change happens. That's where we've seen all the movements happening in Bangladesh in the past few years and in other countries. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that, Eileen. And I wanted to take this um, as an opportunity to sort of bridge to Anshul um, with a comment that we have from uh, Almir Asan Asif. And since we've gotten into a conversation where we are chatting about potential solutions and, and the potential role that young people can play, um, um, what what uh, Almir has commented is, what are the opportunities for South Asian youth to collaborate together to fight this crisis? Uh, this call today is a testimonial of the incredible power of young people coming together um, to speak about and, and create a space about things that are important to them, which is this pandemic that we're facing. And, and we've, seen, um, we've seen inklings and examples of this through uh, the climate marches that we've had um, um, over the last few, year, last few months. Globally, but um, what opportunities do you see, Anshul, and what skills do you see young people needing to develop in order to be able to collaborate together um, um, as, a, as a society? Thank you so much, Shantanu. Uh, I think um, the, I mean, the, the, the fact that you mentioned 
um, that we've seen how young people have really used the power of their voice to create an impact uh, is what we actually really need. I think we all have the um, easiest, uh, uh, cheapest tool available to all of us, which is the internet. Um, we all have the ability to speak up. I think we should start speaking up now uh, for each other, about each other. Uh, we should use this as an opportunity to make sure that we're also talking about people who cannot use these platforms to speak up, like I said in my first answer as well. Um, and I think because I, I completely agree with my co-panelists that, you know, uh, it's not just about policy. We have to get to the ground and, and, and do it. But at the same time, I do feel that that policy gives you scale. Um, and I think that demand needs to start coming up as well. Like, uh, and, and, you know, now uh, for sure at this point. Um, simultaneously, Shantanu, I also feel one one very critical thing which will help us all come together uh, and 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 you know fight this and really imagine a better future is if we let go of the um, stigma, stereotypes, and and you know the the kind of differences that have kept us apart, especially the three countries on the panel right now, right? And 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 that's been the status quo. I think this is the opportunity for us to reject that outrightly and say that you know we are going to come together because all three of us are young countries, all uh, three of our young people are going to suffer terribly uh, and we're not gonna take it anymore. And we're gonna definitely make sure that we uh, cross those, those, those uh, boundaries of stigma and, and, and stereotypes and discrimination and really voice ourselves uh, together. So I think the core skill that we really need at this point is empathy towards each other, towards our, our individual situations and towards the kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, towards the manner in which uh, we are kind of countering this and, and trying to fight this, uh, this crisis and this pandemic. So I think, uh, I think that's, that's at the very core of, of the skills that we really need, because once we go into the post pandemic phase, like Ali very rightly mentioned, I think that's a, it's, it's a core uh, issue to talk about which is how do we really recover? How do we really reintegrate? What will happen afterwards? Like we don't know right now. Uh, will we even have enough jobs? Will we have enough uh, you know, people to, to, to really take those challenges on? So I think um, right now is probably a good time for us to, to let go of our uh, past differences. It's a good time for us to look at how we can empathetically collaborate and make sure that these opportunities rise up for all of us together. Uh, and, and that's where I feel, um, you know, like you said, this panel is a great example. Uh, I know, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying for all three of us, but I know for sure that we are more than happy to open up our platforms to young people from, from across South Asia and across the world um, to really come together, collaborate, start projects together, um, you know, seek funding together, look for organizations that can support this kind of work together. Uh, because I know for a fact that, you know, while we are all trying to grapple with this situation, there are uh, organizations out there, there are institutions out there that are also looking for young people who can be the solution creators of tomorrow because now the world that we're gonna see after this is gonna be very different and we need solutionists who can actually challenge that uh, kind of a reality that we're gonna go into. So I think um, Ali already mentioned this, it's a time for opportunity as well. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's upon young people who can really figure out how to use the privilege that they have and the power that they have to make sure that we take the step forward, uh, uh, you know, in, in, into a much better uh, scenario. Right. And then I have a follow up question for you, um, Anshul. Um, uh, there's some comments in, a, in, the, in the comment box that um, are speaking of the impeding youth em employment crisis that that will hit us. Right. And and you yeah. um, very correctly mentioned that in this globalized world that we live in, that's rapidly changing. Um, the core skill of empathy um, is critically important for all young people to engage with. Um, I think um, a common issue that young people face is not knowing where to start, right? Um, we, we all hear empathy as a value. Uh, we think empathy is a skill. We hear different things. But what are some practical tips that you have for the youth who are uh, watching today to develop this skill of empathy? So uh, I think uh, Shantanu, I mean, I can talk from my own experience of, of trying to develop empathy and, 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 you know, working with young people in my team who, uh, you know, have phenomenal empathy towards each other and, and, and you know, uh, understand each other's differences. Uh, I think the, the one very important thing that we need to do is know about each other's cultures and about each other's societies really, really well. Uh, I think history can teach us a lot. And I think that's what we really need to invest time uh, in and really figure out where do we all really come from. Uh, I think another very important aspect of developing empathy is that uh, at the end of the day, we all have to learn to put ourselves in other people's shoes. We cannot be, um, you know, sitting where we are thinking that we have it 
worse because we don't. Um, and you know, if if you look at our society and if you look at how our uh, society is structured, uh, you will always you know find people who've actually got it much worse than you. So I think it's time to really wake up to that reality and try and understand what that's really like uh, as best as we can. Because we we of course we can't live that reality, but we can try our best to understand it. Um, third, I think is that it's 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 super important to uh, you know let go of of a lot of the uh, inhibitions and like I said in my previous answer, the stereotypes that we've kind of been living with. Um, it's like Ali mentioned, it's a time for us to really take a step forward and find uh, a way to create opportunity for ourselves and not just for ourselves but for others around us. And I think that's really uh, something that we need to do to make sure that we as a collective, as a generation, are able to build. Uh, empathy for ourselves and for each other, because I think that's the that's the best that we can do right now. Fantastic, and it'd be good at this stage to um, ask our audience who are watching live to um, write in the comment section. Um, what is something that you do to try and develop this skill of empathy? Um, try and give tips to the to the other members who are on board as well and watching in the comment section. I wanted to go to Ali with with a very interesting question we have from a viewer in Canada. Um, a big shout out to. Uh, Nader Yama from Canada, who has joined us um, from the other, other other side of the world, as well as all our viewers who have joined us from, from uh, North America, South America, and um, very far away places. Um, um, Nader mentioned that she is an um, Afghan and she represents the voices of Afghani, Afghani youth, um, um, as well who are facing anxiety, who are facing um, aspects of mental health. Um, there's a lot of different issues that young people from Afghanistan are facing together. But despite this, Ali, um, she said that young people are trying to get together on a single platform to try and connect with each other and help each other out, to mobilize resources and to create change. I know that through your work with Yes Network Pakistan, you have been enabling young people in Pakistan to be able to do this exact thing, right? Um, so if you were to give some tips um, and guidance to um, um, someone like Nader, um, what would you say um, um, in a situation like this where youth can get together mobilize resources, where do they start and how can they do so? You're just on mute again, uh, Ali. Um, one second. We'll have to unmute you. I think um, there's always a suspense to hear you speak, Ali. That's why the, the technology takes a bit of time. We've got you now, though. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, actually, it's a great question. Uh, thank you very much for asking this. You see, the biggest challenge uh, right now, young people are facing not only in Pakistan, all over the world, especially in countries like Afghanistan and many other countries. You see, the freedom to take initiative. You see, they lack freedom to take initiative. And number two, they lack trust-based environment. You know, most of the times we talk about knowledge and skills. Trust me, I met so many young people who have a lot of knowledge, or a lot of skills, but they don't have the freedom to exercise initiative. They don't have the trust-based environment. You see, how do I come to know that what I'm capable of? I come to know through my environment. And my environment doesn't give me this identity to me. My environment doesn't allow me to go out and try out something. You know, it holds me back. It asks me to back off. Unless and until you achieve something academically, you know, you achieve, you know, good grade, you, you show your, you know, intelligence in certain areas. Otherwise, you have no chance to add value in the society. By following this model, we have excluded a massive youth, you know, from this development process. And this is why I'm against this kind of a model where you decide that who is more intelligent and less intelligent. I think we need to create a society where there is an equal opportunity for every young person, regardless of their background, culture, creed, religion, you know, education. You know, they must be given one, at least one chance to add value. And as, you know, Anshu was saying, it's so important to develop empathy, but how empathy will be developed? It cannot be developed in the, in the classrooms. It cannot be developed, you know, in the four walls. You have to go out, you have to interact with the society. The best way to develop this empathy among students, among young people, is to allow them to interact with the society. Once they start interacting with the society, they will learn their pain. They will learn their deprivations. They will learn their hopelessness and helplessness and the mounting tragedies they are facing. It will change them from insight. You see, this education we are getting right now is not helping young people to change their belief system. Young people have talents, but they don't have the belief system. And their talents becomes the victim of their belief system. 
You see, everyone is born with a change making potential, but unfortunately, they don't have the right company, they don't have the right environment. So that's why I'm saying that we have to go back and change the paradigms. I don't want to work along with young people because I want to see that the educational institutions, the technical institutions, the communities, you know, the, all the ministries to create conditions where young people can find their power. You know, the task at our hand is not to educate kids, it's to help them to discover themselves, is to find themselves. You know, development is all about discovery. It's not about, you know, treating young people as empty vessels into which we pour our wisdom, provide the knowledge and skills and, and wait and see what happens with that, your knowledge and skills. We must connect them, young people, immediately to the society, let them find a way to advance in the society. This is the best way forward. We have to, you know, bring the conceptual shift from helping few young people to become entrepreneurs to helping every person to add value in society. You know, we have to take this concept out of business studies and economic studies and at least provide one opportunity to everyone. And I really wanted to see that government and, you know, bigger institutions, as Anshul has said, you know, we have to take it to the scale now. You know, we have been working in isolation for so many years. You know, we have not been able to change the paradigms. And this change will, can, this change will only happen when we will be able to change the paradigms. And paradigms will only be changed when we have a community of knowledge and practice. And once we create this knowledge, a community of knowledge and practice, we will be able to change the results. So I'm hopeful that, you know, you know, things will start changing. We have learned a lot from this. You know, already we have seen that how many, uh, you know, uh, lives we have lost because of our inability to respond at the right time, because of our, you know, incapability to anticipate challenges. You know, the problem with the world is that people who have experience have no imagination. And those who have imagination, they don't have experience. So <laughs> if you have not in a different idea, so I hope that young people will fill this gap if they are given the chance to add value in the society. Fantastic. And, and this is a, a great opportunity to uh, let our audience know that the panelists who are on board today each run fantastic social media platforms. Uh, I know that Youth Kiawas has a page, um, Acumen Academy Bangladesh, as well as um, um, Yes Network Bangladesh um, having a page, as well as our, of course, partners, BYLC, who are running this summit. Um, um, and and uh, these platforms do post tips and opportunities for young people to get on board and help them discover this potential that Ali is speaking about. So when you do have the time, do go ahead and like the social media links. Uh, the team will post the, the links on the comment box, um, but please do go ahead and like. Um, I wanted to go to Eileen now, and there's a comment from um, uh, Saramsh Karel, and, and it's around, again, the, 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 the year of employability. Uh, Saramsh uh, has mentioned in the comment that for low-income countries, um, such as Bangladesh and Pakistan, the IMF and the World Bank has declared mass massive amounts of debt and support to enable the economies of these countries to redevelop. Um, but, the sh but what Saramsh is worried about is, as a graduated student, as, as someone who's just uh, finished um, getting out of college and getting out of school. Um, uh, she was, uh, she or she was prepared um, to enter the, the workforce um, through the skills and knowledge developed, right? Um, but this, this um, coronavirus has put this all on hold and it's, it's largely representative of the world that we live in today. We've seen um, because of rapid changes and because of rapid introduction of technology, there's been a lot of young people who have gone through institutions and learned skills and, and developed the knowledge and, and gotten degrees, but they've come out without having a, scol a solid idea as to what they can do next because the job, job place and job marketplace is changing rapidly. Um, if you were to speak from a Bangladesh perspective, Eileen, um, what would you give as a tip to um, Saramsh in a situation like this? Um, what, what, what would you advise uh, him or her to do given that they're in the situation? Sure. Thank you. So um, at BYLC, I remember we, we used to speak about the fact that at universities, you learn something. And then when you come to the real world, there's a huge gap between what is taught and what's expected in the real world. And I have to say that because of the coronavirus, I am sure that that gap is now 50 fold or 70 fold. So what that would look like. Uh, but I think the same principles apply, which is this idea of learning to learn um, and adaptability. So regardless of which institution you're from or where you are heading towards, those are like the two skills that are a must have. Um, another we could add for today's days um, is this idea of moral imagination. 
So um, the audacity to, to imagine a world that it could be, but also have the resilience to be able to work in the current context. Um, it's, it's really about you know, trying to figure out what your superpower is and given the current situation, the current context, maybe putting your ideal career on hold, but really thinking about how you can add value to, to this new world. Um, and I think as more and more of us, including you know, all of us on the panel are also trying to figure out how we can not become redundant and add more value. Um, as we do that, um, hopefully that's the, that's the new norm that we're talking about. Um, us at Acumen, we do physical seminars. We, we meet our fellows, we meet our communities all the time. And now we're not able to do that. So how are we supposed to hold them, hold them and also grow and learn and prosper and get, you know, basically get people to reach their full potential? That's a question we're also grappling with. So it's hard, you know, it's a very hard question that that all of us today are grappling with. Of course, the the newbies the ones who are just coming into the job market, the ones who are just graduating um, are, are more shaken up. But at the same time, remember, you have something that we don't, you know, you can experiment, you have the resilience, you have the grit, you have that power. Um, so it's really about how you are able to use that and come out stronger than COVID-19. Fantastic, Eileen. And, and um, every time you speak, I think, um, um, the response is always with an element of hope and, 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 a, and a way to look forward. So we thank you for that encouragement and that positivity, positivity that we all need in, in a time like this. And, and um, there was a question, I mean, you just, you just spoke about um, um, the skill sets needed and, and sort of how we need to reframe uh, what our futures look like over the next few years. And, and there was a question and reflection um, from Saud Hussain, um, where, where Saud is facing a situation where um, um, they are in a mid-career position where they've been in the job market for about five years now um, and they're facing a dilemma of, okay, um, they were set and they had an idea as to what they wanted to do. But now, uh, because of job security concerns, they need to stay doing what they were doing, right? Um, and I'm sure this is a common problem that you've heard through the, the various people you're connected with at Acumen Academy Bangladesh. But um, um, does, does what you said change for mid-career professionals, Eileen, or would it stay the same, the advice stay the same? I mean, I think it's also an opportunity to see what the new, um, what the new outlook would be. And, um, you know, kind of taking that, that step or their chance and, and becoming an entrepreneur, you know. Um, I think the world needs, even if they're not physical entrepreneurs, this entrepreneurial mindset. Um, and that's really because it's, it's about experimenting. It's like setting rules and then changing them and then moving forward. Um, it's about getting out of your comfort zone and always kind of dancing on that edge. Um, so I would definitely say if you have that opportunity on the side, see if you can try experiments um, and see what works and what doesn't. And, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think there is definitely uh, success there. It's fantastic. Um, where, the, where there is a problem that we face, there's always an opportunity. What, 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 a, what a beautiful remark and what a beautiful way to sum, sum it up. I, I recognize that we're five minutes from time. So um, and we are quickly running out of, of the time that we've um, put together for this panel. But I wanted to end with the last comments from each one of our panelists. Um, and I know that um, a lot of you had comments that you had put in the comments section. Um, I do encourage you to keep putting these comments in the comment section. And, and um, I encourage you to all engage in discussion. As Anshul mentioned um, uh, a while ago uh, during this, during this um, webinar, um, it's very important that we do start dialogue um, amongst ourselves and we do enable and help each other to answer some of these key, um, um, key and un, um, uncharted questions that we have and that we're all facing. So please do keep the conversation going in the comment section below. And we look forward to answering these questions and engaging with with these topics of discussion over the next few days as, as we um, continue with the summit. But um, speaking of you, Anshul, I mean, we have a few minutes left. Um, I'm calling this the power minute. We, we end with a power minute. Um, if there was one message that you would have to send to the youth who are uh, viewing this um, webinar today and 
we've engaged with this conversation, what would it be? Wow, so much pressure, Shantanu. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there are a couple of things, but I'll quickly sum it up. Uh, like I said, um, if you have the the power of voice, use it not just for yourself but for others who are uh, suffering greatly right now. Um, but at the same time, I do want to say that. Uh, nobody has the answers and that's just the truth we don't know what's going to happen we are not experts i don't know what's going to happen to my organization either like things are changing drastically right um so i think the only thing that i can say is that we all have to learn together we all have to learn to overcome this at some point um and like uh, you know eileen mentioned very beautifully in the last answer that we have to find opportunities once this is over uh, we have to find the the right path for ourselves when this is when this is over uh, and we can't do it alone so i think the only um important thing that i would say is that let's let's value each other let's value our abilities uh, to really help each other out and and do that once this is all uh, over because it will be over and and uh, i'm sure we'll find a way ahead fantastic um ali any last words to to our audience today again you're on mute ali so i think um as as custom with this call today it takes about 5 seconds on average to unmute you uh, and we we'll, we'll, we'll just wait for that 5 seconds and a quick shout out while we're waiting for ali's um ali's uh, uh ali to mute himself um a quick shout out to our audience from pakistan who joined as well today we, we encourage you to keep uh, joining us for the conversation over the next few days and incredible sessions that we have coming up yes over to you ali always remember that your life begin only when you do something yes there is a lockdown but compassion is not locked down creativity is not locked down innovation is not locked down relationship building is not locked down so let's do what we can do to overcome the situation brilliant power 20 seconds on thank you and i lean uh, we will leave, leave you with the last comments here and, and I, I have a feeling that you will offer some hope and positivity uh, to wrap us up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think for me it's two things similar to what um, the other panelists said. Uh, one is really around self-knowledge and purpose. Um, this is that opportunity where we can really reflect, um, understand our own identity, um, understand our own powers, but also the power of possibilities. um and the next thing that ali said this idea of building and sustaining real relationships that can really take us through this time and also carry us forward um in in our next lives when we are um safe healthy and happy fantastic thank you so much again for that optimism eileen um and i thank our incredible panelists today uh for giving up some of their uh, some of their time to join us and join our um incredible audience who have been on this conversation and following for the last hour or so um i know that each and every one of you are busy doing workshops and and trying to enable youth to develop the very skills and the values that you just spoke about over the last hour and and we are thankful for your contributions um um i again do encourage our audience to follow the pages the social media pages of our panelists and we'll do our very best to post these uh, social media pages um in the comment section and and follow the work that um each one of our panelists are doing in their individual countries um i also wanted to encourage um you all to join um the the sessions that we have coming up over the next two days um the bylc team um in partnership with its uh, outreach partners and academic partners has put together some fantastic sessions um um on the impact of of, of this uh pandemic um on social enterprises on the development sector um on public health as well as many many other topics of interest that young people have been speaking to us about and and have um said that they're concerned about so um do follow the bylc page on facebook to um uh, see what we have coming up tomorrow as well as the day after as well um what a fantastic session i think um we we all learned a lot today and i think um um one one comment that you mentioned i leave um sticks to me right um that there is no hierarchy in grief or suffering right um each and every single one of our um experiences during this pandemic is valuable and needs a space to be heard and and in order for 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 this experience to be heard we need what you said actually we need each other to we need to be supporting each other we need to be working in a way where we're listening to to each other we need to be practicing the skill of empathy and developing the skill of empathy 
And then, I mean, of course, Ali, you mentioned time and time again that when there is a problem, there's always an opportunity. And, and it's important that we develop humility through um, applying compassion. We, we, we um, apply humility through developing new skills and relevant skills that young people can take and, and then um, um, move head on after this, uh, after this pandemic and, and after um, we get through what we're going through as a society. But I wanted to thank you all again, and I want to thank our audience. Please do keep in touch. Please do com keep commenting on our comment section below and do keep the conversation going on these topics, these very relevant topics that we've started here today. We'll be in touch and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.